Hey everybody out there in Bible study land, this is Jody or Tex as I like to call him today and I am Pastor Jeff and these are your Bible study study announcements. Can I borrow your jacket? No. Put it on? Don't touch me ever again. Jody! Whoa! (laughs) Tell them about tonight! Tonight! We got a picnic happening at Buford Park. At the park! 5 p.m. Be, Be there. there. <laughs> Food. Snow Food. cones. Stop it. Great stuff. No, come on in here. We're keeping on it. No, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. There's going to be games. There's going to be snow cones. There's All gonna free. Be food. Free. Free. Hamburgers. Hot dogs. Maybe even a secret ingredient to said hot dog. Yes. Just you wait. Special. So free. So this is what I want you to do right now. Be there. Don't be there right now. Be there tonight at 5. And bring somebody. Invite somebody. Text somebody right now. Say, hey, I'm going to the picnic. Come with me. Buford Park. Tonight. No evening service. Mm-hmm. <laughs> service. No evening service. No, we got this. Yeah. <laughs> We're hanging out at the park. <laughs> be there. Jody, no more mistakes. No more mistakes. Stop with the laughing and the screaming shenanigans. We're trying to film a video here. Okay. Trunk or treat announcement. Take one. Hi, everybody. There you go with the screaming. Take two. Hey, everybody. (laughs) Stop laughing. Stop. You broke the thing. This is really you. Hi, everybody. Why are we greeting? We've Every already time. greeted. I don't know. They're welcome. I don't know what's going on here. Hey! <laughs> Say welcome. <laughs> Stop. Trunk or treat. Trunk or treat. <laughs> Come on. Trunk or treat is getting closer. We are now in October, October. so please continue to bring candy, buy it, bring it. At the entrances, you'll find rope buckets. Drop in your candy. Mm-hmm. We now have a sweeter meter, a sweeter meter, a candy meter, hanging up filled. in the hub to track our progress of how much candy we have. What is also in the hub? Uh, the availability of you to sign up for a trunk. Sign up for a trunk for trunk or yes. treat because it's trunk or treat. So you yes. put but, the candy in the trunk. Yeah, can't have trunk or treat without trunks. trunks. So we would love your family to play a part in this great event, community outreach. So event, bring candy, sign up to host a trunk today. Ooh, one take. Good job. Good morning, church family. In the coming weeks, you're going to begin seeing and hearing a lot about Christmas at first. I would like to take a few minutes to share ways that you can be involved. If you're a musician, there's still time to join a wonderful choir and orchestra. I hope you'll consider using your talents as we lead in worship during December. If you're not a musician, there are other ways that you can serve. In your class this morning, you should see two lists of Christmas at First teams. The first list covers the production side of our program. We need builders for the sets and the stages, ushers inside the building and in the parking lots, costume designers, and folks to help reset the building for the Sunday activities after our Saturday night presentation. The second list is specific to our Saturday night presentation. We have partnered with Can Help, Heart of Hope, Community Chest, Hope House, and Community in Schools to provide tangible gifts to some of our needy families in our community. Our guests are going to be invited to attend a Christmas dinner in our fellowship hall, followed by the Christmas at First presentation in our sanctuary. At the conclusion of the program, they will have the opportunity to hear about the real gift of Christmas, Jesus Christ. They will have had the gospel presented to them through music, drama, and in a message from our pastor. Following the pageant, each family will receive a bag of groceries, a Bible, and a gift for every child. We need volunteers to help with purchasing, wrapping, and distributing gifts, serving as hosts to our guests for the evening, decorating our fellowship hall, serving the Christmas meal, and many other ways. The list you have in your classroom has details and specific dates. If you're willing to serve, please take a moment and sign up by going to ssfbc.org serve. 
If you have any questions, please stop me in the hall, email, call, or come by the worship ministry office. Thank you for your willingness to serve in this outreach as we share the love of Christ in our community. Before we get out of here, I want to remind you of a couple of things. First, we are collecting the Mary Hill Davis Mission offering. That offering goes to taking the gospel across the great big state of Texas. Texas. Our goal this year is $18,000. We're still a ways off, so I would love for you to pray and seek the Lord and find out how he would lead you to give. So that's one. Two, if you signed up to pray for a high school student last Sunday, you can pick up your envelope today. If you haven't done so, head to the hub. We have them in alphabetical order. Find your envelope, take it home, and begin to pray for your high school student now. If you haven't joined us for worship, come 11 o'clock in the worship center. Then tonight, not here, picnic, Buford Buford Park, 5 p.m. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm living for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Welcome, everybody, to Radio TV Bible Class, First Baptist Church of Sulphur Springs, the friendliest place you could ever be on a Sunday. We'd love to have you here as you're watching on TV or listening on the radio. we got plenty of spaces here, and it would be a blessing to us to see you come. We'd like to see your face and know who you are. Uh, we've been told that uh, this is broadcast on the Internet, and I have personally picked this up as far as San Antonio, so I know that it's... Good. I didn't run down there today. I needed to be here. But I want you to know that we would love to have you here. You're welcome here. And if there's something that uh, you'd like for us to know about you, send a message to the church office and we would like to hear from you. Would you join me in prayer this morning, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for such a nice fall morning. You've cooled off this earth here. Lord, we need a little rain. We have a lot of farmers and people that depend on it this time of the year. Father, there's a lot of folks that we know that need you, that want you, and we know that you're watching over them. We have those that are sick and disabled to be here. God, we thank you for sending all these people out. It's a witness to you that we can be a witness to somebody else. We want to thank you so much for our teacher, for our music, and for this time together. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Good morning this morning. Good looking group. The room's almost full. Looks wonderful. It's going to sound wonderful. We're going to sing a song everybody knows the heart. If you've got a man's voice, you can sing bass on this. 608. We'll work. Till Jesus comes. O land of rest for thee, I sigh, when will the moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace and home?
singing this morning. We got a, another, well, this guy had been here before. <laughs> we got another good teacher this morning. Eddie Northcutt, thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we're going to be in Jonah. We're starting a new book today. Do not be ashamed to use your table of contents. Remember, this is one of the minor prophets, not because of any level of significance, but because of its length. It is four short chapters. Uh, we, if your Bible is turning a little easier to Amos, having spent a few weeks there, it's two books later. It's Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. We are Jamesless today. James Litzler is teaching for Dwayne McMeans. Um, as you uh, may know, Dwayne's wife Kay has been really critically ill in and out of ICU at our hospital with, um, uh, had her gallbladder removed. Um, she has a lot of infection. She has sepsis. I was going to say infection. She has an infection. My nurse wife corrected me. <laughs> Sepsis, that's infection on steroids. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but she is uh, battling all of the different things. And so we certainly want to, to be praying for them. So James Litzler is teaching for Dwayne McMeans. And then James Scott sent me a text today, and he is uh, listening by live streaming. He's recovering from some dental surgery of some kind. So he uh, will want to lift up James as well. As I mentioned, we're going to be studying Jonah, and you know, the story, we're going to, uh, there are four chapters, we're only going to be spending two weeks covering the book of Jonah, um, I'll cover the first two this week, James Scott is slated to cover the next two next week, and then that's it, and the story from Jonah that is really universally known I mean, if, if this is probably among the stories outside Christendom or uh, the, the uh, Hebrew faith that people just know. I mean, and, and when we think about this, it has really kind of devolved into almost slapstick comedy. Jonah running, gets on a ship bad storm, gets thrown over, swallowed by a large fish, um, spends a few days in there, and then vomited up on a beach. As I walked in today, I had two discussions. The first was more pleasant than the second. The first was about German chocolate cake with Helen. The second was where exactly Jonah was vomited on the beach, and that was with Mickey. I don't know. <laughs> Mickey has been on uh, and, and touring over there at least some, uh, and I suspect, as I told him, it would be by tradition that that's the beach uh, area where Jonah was uh, deposited on the beach by the large fish. I don't think that's actually recorded in the Bible, so that would be by tradition if they say where it was. Um, you know, you'll often see in church nurseries, picture of the big whale and Jonah. I don't remember the exact circumstances in the Pinocchio story with Geppetto. If I remember correctly, Geppetto is the, the builder of the puppet and then the dad of the boy, if I remember correctly, and somehow or another, Geppetto ends up inside um, a, a, a large fish or whale. And you remember there, he's it's cavernous in there. He's got a kerosene lamp and some furniture. He's, you know, quite at home. Um, we're going to talk about the fact is, you know, there are many commentaries. I've read a lot uh, in the last few weeks, um, and there are different approaches about um, the story of Jonah that we have, whether it's allegory whether it is symbolism, parabolic, that is a parable, um, or whether it's actually a, an historic event that um, is recorded for us and for which we are to learn something about, like many of the other stories. As you know, I wonder what in the world is going on. Somebody's <laughs> playing like bowling upstairs. I didn't, apparently we have a bowling alley upstairs now, but... Um, uh, 
the, the, whether or not it's a historical event or whether it's just parabolic. I tend to think, and I'll give you my reasons for, the fact that I believe Jonah was a historical person and this is a historical event. It is miraculous. It is supernatural. Not unlike many of the other miraculous supernatural events that we read. And for some reason, though, we tend to more readily accept those in the Baptist evangelical faith that believes the, um, the, the literal aspects of the Bible, the historical aspects of the Bible. We tend to um, believe some of the other uh, great miracles of the Bible a little easier than this one for some reason. And I think it's because, well, think, you know, if you got swallowed by... Now, by the way, we don't know if it's a whale... It, it was a large fish. The he, it's written in Hebrew. It, it, it probably was a whale or it was just some large fish creature that the Lord God Almighty created for that particular purpose at that particular time. In fact, there's a word in there used four times throughout the book called appointed, that, that, that the Lord appointed that big fish to do that very thing. So what nature it was, but certainly even in history, there are uh, incidences recorded of people who have actually been kind of sucked in, if you will, by a large sperm whale or a large whale of some kind, only to be thrown up uh, later, not usually after three days and three nights, but, uh, but they are, they're thrown up. But the reality would be, of course, that it is a miraculous event. I think she's trying to get in. She just couldn't open that door. But um, at any rate... Um, here is the, my, my um, argument that this is historic in nature. We have recently studied First and Second Kings. We just finished studying the book of Amos. And in Second Kings uh, chapter 14, there is a reference during uh, the reign of Jeroboam II. Jeroboam II. That was a couple of kings later after Ahaz, northern kingdom of Israel not a good king, said he restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Araba. By the way, this is roughly, there's a little bit of overlap, but there's, this is roughly the same time that Amos was prophesying. We just spent, I forget now, I think four full weeks in the book of Amos. And remember, Amos was actually from Judah, but called by God to prophesy in the northern kingdom of Israel. And remember, they had he was they had some times of prosperity and things seemed to be going well, um, but there were storm clouds on the horizon, if you will. And he was prophesying to them about the Assyrians, how they were gaining strength again, and how, in fact, his prophecy was that the nation of Israel would be captured by the the uh, the Assyrians, and of course that came to be. Now, that was obviously an unpopular message, as we saw, but that's the context. It's important for us to understand. That's the context of the call of God on Jonah's life to go to Nineveh and preach to them. He wanted no part of that for a variety of reasons. He gives us a, a very good reason he, when he's yelling at God. I, that's next week. But he tells us it's not because he's just trembling in fear because of the mighty Assyrians. There may have been some of that because he was going to preach an unpopular message, but he didn't like them. He didn't think they deserved God's mercy and grace, and he wanted no part of going to them to be a messenger of God uh, to them. But back to what I was reading. He, Jeroboam, restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah. Just know that he's expanding the kingdom. According to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he, God, spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from gath Helfer. Now, that's in the area known to us in New Testament times as Nazareth, in that same area. We also know that in Matthew chapter 12, it is also recorded in Luke chapter 11, I believe, Jesus is having one of his little... Uh, dialogues with the religious leaders and they're still trying to trap him and trick him and figure out who he is and establish yourself show us your authority 
And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. He'd been performing signs and wonders and miracles as part of his ministry. They wanted, they wanted a show. They wanted to see something. But he, Jesus, answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given, it, given to it except the sign of of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So when he says the sign of Jonah, he's referring to the miraculous event that we're going to read about, the supernatural, miraculous event that God did. Now, I actually read, and it's frankly offensive to me, that some of the commentaries will say, well, yeah, Jesus was just playing upon the ignorance of the people, and so he was kind of going along, really? The Son of God, (laughs) the way, the truth, and the life, is just dabbling in deception? I don't think so. He is talking about a, a historical event. And so we have here Jonah, a prophet, a prophet who's referenced in the book of Kings, ministering during the time of Jeroboam II, uh, that that is a contemporary uh, of Amos, who, as I said, was preaching about judgment at the hands of the Assyrians. And this is about the first half of the 8th century, roughly about a half a century or so before they are defeated by the Assyrians. Now, One thing I think we'll all recognize, and perhaps one of the reasons deep down why we love Jonah, is Jonah is somebody we can identify with. It is sometimes difficult to identify with others. But there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us, whether it's uh, our ability to identify with his disobedience and our disobedience, or his ineptness, because man is he inept, Um, uh, or his distress. Now, we have talked a lot, whether we're studying Job or other books, about the difficulties that we experience this side of heaven and how difficult it can be, though I think it's worthy for each of us when we go through troubling times to reflect with the request of the power of the Holy Spirit to help us interpret our circumstances so that we are in God's will, the center of God's will, if he is trying to teach us something, if in fact what we're going through is discipline, help us understand what the purpose of that is, the source or the need for us to be disciplined so that we can take corrective action. And that is just an ongoing thing that we have this side of heaven as we are constantly being sanctified, made into the image of Christ. But sometimes, like we saw with Job, Job hadn't done anything wrong. It was the sovereignty of God, a loving, sovereign, gracious, merciful God. And sometimes, like our boy Jonah, (laughs) it's because of disobedience. And we see that, and it's absolutely clear. The title, uh, you'll be interested to know, I'm going to go mostly by the lesson this time. I I say that because that is so rare that I do it, uh, but it's entitled No Escape. And when we think about no escape, um, we we think about this question uh, for us today. Do we actually have to go somewhere to run from God? Now here, we're going to see Jonah try to do that, but so that we won't try to kind of put that on and say, well, I've never actually gotten in my car or hopped on a boat or a plane and run to another location to run from God. Maybe you have, but there are other ways. We can run from God, and we often do, but we cannot escape from God ever. And that's what Jonah is going to uh, teach us. I remembered, uh, well, in part, because as I opened my book, I usually, now I, I have two different Bibles that I generally work from. One is a thinner one, usually when I'm not teaching, a thinner one uh, that's an NIV that I got 
uh, on my deacon ordination 20 years ago. And then this one, which is my favorite, my study Bible, I've referenced it before. It's the English Standard Version, but it's got incredible annotations in it. And I write in here, like I did this morning, when the pastor preaches. And like today, I wrote J. Graven's 10 to 22 a.m. mini morning service, and then parenthetically, uh, a conclusion of sermon series, Storms of Life that we had today in Hebrews. What a wonderful service, what a wonderful sermon it was. And then as I looked, I recalled that uh, Pastor Jeff, uh, and you may recall, he'd only been here a few months, had a six-week sermon series out of the book of Jonah uh, entitled Jonah, A Study of Delayed Obedience. And I went back and watched two of the six. I watched the introductory one and then skipped to, I think it was the third one, that deals primarily with what we're going to do today. I'm really glad I did because I discovered some neat things that as our pastor has, as the Lord has used our pastor in shepherding us and preaching his sermon series and developing them, there were some neat little developments in that particular uh, deal. But again, we're talking about, in my mind, my belief, a historical miraculous event. And again, we sometimes have trouble. It's part of, I think, our faith and the times in which we live. I think it's even harder for people with the advancements of science for people to believe in supernatural miraculous movements of God. Thomas Jefferson had so much of a problem with that that he created his own Bible where he literally took a straight razor and cut out the miraculous events of, in the New Testament, the miraculous events of Jesus, and titled it, if I remember correctly, I wish I'd written it down, something to the effect, The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, what a great teacher. What wonderful words of life we can all live by. All, and, and, and if we just put away those silly schoolgirl miracles we can focus on what he was really about, which is sad, just absolutely sad. The Lord required, by, by the way, the fact that the Bible is preserved for us as it is in all of the many attempts over 2,000 years or more, more than, has preserved the Bible for our consideration is itself miraculous and an act of God. So let's just recap what we know. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, same guy, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up uh, before me. Now, remember, Nineveh is the great city of Assyria, um, and he's saying, Go preach to them. And Jonah wants no part of it. Verse 3, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. I, I think whoever wrote this, especially the English translation, just had fun with the fact that they put the word Tarshish three times in two verses, because who can say Tarshish correctly? Um, and nobody for sure knows there are two primary theories of where Tarshish is. One is present day, or, or Tarsus, present day Turkey. The most common uh, belief is that it's somewhere in pres on the coast of present-day Spain. Here's the important thing, and I'll show you on the map. He leaves from Joppa, which, by the way, he left even Israel, because that's in the Philistine area. That's a Philistine city. He goes over here, hops on a ship with a bunch of sailors of various nationalities, He's supposed to be, if he's obedient to God, going this way, about 600 miles northeast to Nineveh. He gets here, and he's going uh, roughly a couple of thousand miles, if it's in fact the, Spa the coast of Spain, that way. He's headed the absolute opposite direction. In fact, if you may, you may recall the series, the pastor's first sermon in, in this was fast in the wrong direction, <laughs> um, is what he called that, uh, that sermon. So he rose to flee from Tarshish. He went down to Joppa. There's so much fun things that if we had more time, we could get into it. His continued use of the word, he went down to Joppa, went down to Tarshish, paid, paid the fare, and went down into the ship. Um, we have some, I don't know if it's really anything spiritually we're supposed to get into, 
We're going to see the big storm that comes up. God did it. Um, and he's sound asleep in the bottom of the ship. Kind of reminds you of when Jesus is sound asleep in the ship, in the boat, while everybody's just fearing for their life on the storm that just whipped up there, and they have to go wake him up. Well, the same thing here. Uh, these guys from various nationalities and various religions are scared to death. It is quite the storm. And then they wake this guy up. What are you doing? Who's your God? Pray to your God. Maybe among other, uh, some, some of us can get in on the right line and, and get whoever, whatever God caused all of this to stop. And he says something to the effect, I'm a Hebrew. Uh, I worship the God who created the land and the sea. And while he doesn't, they don't mention it right away, uh, a couple of verses later, it tells us that he told them, and this is all because of me. I should tell you that. God told me to go this way. I'm going this way. And all of this that y'all are experiencing, well, that's my fault. And so uh, he said, well, what can we do about it? Jonah says, really, you ought to just toss me overboard. You ought to just toss me overboard and be done with it. And these guys actually don't want to do that. That they, they tried to row back to shore. And God's not having any of it. The harder they rowed back towards land to drop him off, the stronger the storm got. So that they finally said, God of heaven, now they're worshiping him. God of heaven, don't hold it against us. Please don't, you know, uh, we're going to do what he told us to do. John Piper uh, said he found it interesting that Jonah was concerned about the, oh, you know, maybe 15, 20 men on the ship, but he wasn't concerned with the uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people in Nineveh, uh, as you'll see next week. And actually, I really think it has a lot to do with his mindset. He knew he was being disobedient to God. He was despondent. Um, he was beside himself, and so it was probably easier for him to say, just throw me overboard, just throw me overboard, as opposed to when God does rescue him, and we're going to see that he was genuinely thankful for that, that he was in a mindset that he wasn't exactly where he needed to be. Again, you'll see that next week. So let's pick it up in our selected verses. Verse 17, they've tossed him over. And by the way, I should say, let's, let's, I want to read verse 16. The men, then the men who threw him over, feared the Lord exceedingly. They had that great reference, reverence we're all to have for Jehovah. They feared him exceedingly. Remember, it's not that just they're afraid of him. It's that, it, that reverential, worshipful attitude towards God, re acknowledging who he is and who we are. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now, we don't know what the vows were, what commitments it is that they're making, but here is a wonderful expression of the Lord using events to reach out to the nations, different men from different nations. Verse 17 now. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And by the way, in Hebrew parlance, um, and even as Jesus did, because we know Jesus was not in the grave, what we would today, because we're quite literal, think of three days and three nights. Jesus was, was dead about 40 hours, Friday afternoon to early Sunday morning, right? But as we've said, when they say that, they use the word globally, three day, they mean any part of a day, even though today we would not mean that way. And that's important for us to understand that, that, that he was in the, in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, that word appointed, again, has that, that sovereign movement of God, and it happens four times in this book. He appoints the, the great fish to swallow Jonah. Later, God's going to appoint a plant to grow supernaturally. He's going to appoint a worm to eat it supernaturally. I, th I think about that, and I'm thinking, man, I'd like to feed that worm to my chickens after they it ate the plant. <laughs> Big fat worm. Um, and then he appointed a scorching uh, east wind to, to uh, 
basically harass Jonah. But God appointed that. God is working supernaturally in a fish, in a plant, in an insect, and in, in, the, in weather. God is doing that completely. So we see that the Lord appointed a great fish. And if you read it and miss, don't miss this, because this is the heart of the lesson, really. It sounds like they threw him overboard. Then God sent a fish to swallow him up. And then Jonah prayed. And if you read that, it says, then Jonah prayed. <laughs> right after the fish swallowed him up. But that's not actually, even though that's the order in which they told us, as you can see in the next verse, that's not the order of things here. But as we see God calms, God created the storm here in response to Jonah's disobedience. God created the storm, but God calmed the storm. And our application there is a person's faith is measured by the actions taken in response to God. A person's faith is measured by the actions taken in response to God. And we see men, not Hebrews, not raised with a knowledge and faith in Jehovah, respond to Jehovah in faith, and God calms the storm. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, and here's how we know how he got rescued. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Now, there are some who say, well, first of all, Jonah didn't write this, because it doesn't say Jonah wrote this. And this was probably written some 600 years later. And probably this poem was actually put in there, this, uh, this poetic prayer. The fact that Jonah is speaking alternately in both first and third person is not unusual at all. Writers often do that. Sometimes they use, and I always mispronounce it so I won't try, uh, the clerk, if you will, the scribe, as they, somebody's writing for them. Um, but it's also a literary device to, to speak in the third person. David does that in the Psalms all the time, interchanging speaking directly to God and then about God, as if the audience is somebody else. And we have that here. So you've got Jonah being thrown into the ocean. Now remember, it would be, if you've ever been on a cruise ship, Karen and I have taken a few, and sometimes it's a travel day, and all you're doing is you're just traveling on the high seas, and you see nothing, all 360 degrees around that ship, nothing but water as far as the eye can see. And sometimes that water is very placid. It's just, you could just like skate on it, it just looks like. And I'm, I know probably everybody goes through this. You go through the edge and you look over the ship and you think, oh, what if I fell over? And nobody would know. And I'm just out here treading water. How long could I do that? That's one thing to be thrown over or to go over that way. That's not what happened to Jonah. If you've ever seen Castaway, <laughs> where uh, the ship, the, the plane goes down, and then he's actually in kind of a raft of some kind. And they do a fantastic job of showing at, at, as the lightning flashes and you see the, the size of those waves, 20 to 30 feet high. If you've ever seen the George Clooney movie, The Perfect Storm, which is based on a true story, I mean, you'll, you'll be sitting on your couch with white knuckles just gripping, even though it's just on TV. It's not really happening to you. But that's what Jonah's in. And we're going to see him use some poetic language about just how difficult it was for him. But it said he got thrown over. He was dying. That's the whole reference to Sheol. Sheol was the Hebrew understanding as it theologically and doctrinally developed. That was death. He answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I was knocking on death's door. The realm of the dead is what the, uh, Sheol is called. Not literally in Sheol, but Sheol, but dis, uh, descriptive of his near-death experience. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Now remember here, sometimes when we think about, and the way that it's 
portrayed in pictures and everything, we think that God rescued, as we'll see in verse 10, rescued Jonah from the fish. The fish vomits him up on the beach. That's, I'm not just trying to be graphic. That's what the Bible says. Vomits him up on the beach. The fish was not the threat. The fish was the salvation. The water was the threat. The water is the threat of death here, not the fish, as we will continue uh, to, to see here. Verse 3, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I, sh yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountain. Now, I've gone over a little bit, but what we see here, as you see in your book, the first section, uh, verses uh, one, chapter 115 through 17, where God calms, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 in your book is entitled, God Hears. And the application here is God hears our prayers no matter how desperate the situation. Now, when Pastor Jeff was preaching on this, remember, it's July, at this fact, it was July 28th, 2019. And he has gone back to this time and again as he builds upon it and builds upon it and builds upon it. He has given us, if you'll recall, and he has referenced it many times now in three years, the, a biblical definition of faith. He said the definition of biblical faith, that's probably a better way of putting it, the definition of biblical faith, and it was in this sermon that he first gave it, and he said it slow enough and repeated it so that we could all write it down. He said it's standing, biblical faith is, standing on the promises of God and trusting in the character of God. That's biblical faith. He referenced in there, he said, I haven't counted them, I googled it, that there are purportedly 5,467 promises of God contained in the Bible. But biblical faith is standing on the promises of God and trusting in the character of God. And I don't know if I've ever had a pastor emphasize and teach his congregation more to try to instill and build upon them a biblical, theologically correct understanding of the character of God. In fact, on Sunday nights, he's been going on, I think it's about a 17-year sermon series. It seems like it. I mean, we've been it's covering Psalm chapter 103 that he says may be the single, in one, in one area, the single greatest description of the character of God in all of the Bible. And that's what biblical faith is, standing on the promises of God and trusting in the character of God. Do you need a refresher on the character of God? I commend you to read Psalm 103. He also told us, as we see Jonah's prayer here, that, an in, that prayer is, he gave us this definition. He's gone back to this before. Prayer is an intimate conversation that's that relationship, an intimate conversation between God and his people that leads his people to the will of God. And I thought to myself, you know, there's all kinds of things you can add and talk about, nuanced prayer, but I thought, my gosh, that's it. That is absolutely it. Prayer is an intimate conversation. Understand, not a, di not a monologue where we just speak one-sided to God. An intimate conversation between God and his people that leads his people to the will of God. And I thought, wow, all that came from that sermon, or at least initially came to us from our pastor, from that sermon on uh, chapter 2 of, of, uh, of Jonah. Again, the fish is the refuge of salvation used by God here. Wonderful uh, descriptions there. He said, I, I'm the, the, the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. What, what, what hymn do you think about when you hear about billows passing over you? It is well with my soul when peace like a river attendeth my way, 
when sea billows, when, when, bil, uh, when, when sorrows like sea billows roll. That's, uh, that, that's exactly what I thought of. He said, I, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over. Can you imagine as he's trying to swim to the top and, and struggle for breath? Well, what's going to happen? The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds, seaweeds, were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountain. He's going down. We've seen how sometimes the tallest mountains, not Mount Everest, they're in the sea. And he's going down to the bottom. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Again, uh, a reference toward uh, death. Yet you brought me up. Uh, yet, yet you brought up my life from the pit, from death. The Lord did it. Jonah had done nothing to deserve being rescued. His salvation was by grace alone. And how did that happen that the fish came to swoop him up right as he was knocking on death's door? He prayed. He prayed. And in fact, I love the way that John Piper has a way of telling this story that makes it seem like it was front page news yesterday and gives a kind of an actual almost reporters. It's like, you know, you can, he probably was unconscious, unconscious most of the time. That, that he, he actually, just as he was losing consciousness, the fish comes and gets him. Look at verse 7. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you. That's that prayer that he referenced in verse 2. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Now, we make a lot about this story. When we talk about this story, we do it with kids or people talk about it. And the fish is always central in the story. The fish only gets two verses. <laughs> Look, verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then in verse 10, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And while that's, those are the only two places where the fish is mentioned, if you think about it, it's what God is directing that fish to do both times. Swallow him, spit him out. Both times. God is central in this. God is central in this. And while I often say that, that they're like Daniel, we talk about Daniel in the lion's den, and, and, but the real focus is God. Well, there is a lot of focus on Jonah, and rightfully so here. Because I think in this story, we can so easily identify with Jonah. We may not have quite that level, so, uh, so obvious to everybody else, uh, of willful disobedience to God. But we are often willfully disobedient to God. Maybe in not such a small thing, a life calling that I want you to go 600 miles and, and, and preach to your enemies. Maybe it's something different. But the Lord can get our attention in many, many ways. Verse 8. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Now he may be referencing those fellows on the ship with him. The pagan sailors, he may also be referencing his fellow idolatrous Israelites, who we saw, we saw when we studied First and Second King, how they had incorporated and assimilated all of the area religions and tried to make uh, the, the Jewish faith just one aspect of a multifaceted religious uh, life that they have. But he's saying those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Well, where have we seen that? Sacrifices and vows. The sailors. The showing the proper response to the incredible grace and mercy of God. It is worship. It is sacrifice. It is vowing to God. And we know from the whole counsel of God that when we vow to God... We need to make sure our yes is yes and our no is no, and we don't make idle vows. 
because it does sound like from what he says in verse 9, while it doesn't say it explicitly in chapter 1, when God told him to go to Nineveh, sounds like he said okay, and then headed in the wrong direction, in the opposite direction. Because now he says, but with the voice of thanksgiving for what you have done, you've rescued me, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. And in fact, he does go to Nineveh. And then he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. God saves. Our three things we, from this lesson were God calms, God hears, and God saves. And the application for God saves.